Welcome to IIT Bombay Virtual Competitive Algebra Seminar. Uh, we are very pleased to have Professor Thomas uh, Polstra from University of Virginia, and he will speak on strongly F regular rings, maximal quantum column module, and the Frobenius signature. So, Thomas, Thank you, you are welcome to begin your lecture. At the end of one hour, we will have uh, question answers from audience. All right. So, uh, yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, and also, I ended up lying a little bit in that title. As I was putting my talk together, um, trying to put in F signature stuff at the end just wasn't quite fitting in to the time frame. So I think we're going to pass on F signature stuff today, but I still want to talk about strongly F regular rings, um, maximal column Macaulay modules over these rings, and at the, you know, the the last third or half of the talk is going to be devoted to some applications of the main theorem I'm going to present here concerning the uh, divisor class group of a local F regular frame. So, all right, so for today, or for, yeah, for today, so some notations, some assumptions, running notation and assumptions throughout. So R will be a local ring. Local Notherian. Notherian. <clears throat> um, this is going to be a prime characteristic talk. So P will always denote the characteristic of our ring. We preserve capital F for the Frobenius map. And then uh, what ends up being a useful thing to do. Uh, in this subject is to not only just study the Frobenius, but iterates of the Frobenius, iterate it over and over again. So in the, the type of notation I'd like to use for that is so for every natural number e, so little e for us will always be a natural number. It is going to be used to take iterates of the Frobenius. And of course, the point is here, because we are characteristic p, this is a, the Frobenius map is an honest ring homomorphism. All right. Um, so the assumption we're going to make here is we always assume uh, our ring is what is going to be called F finite. So for those who don't know what this means, so what this means is, is that F, the Frobenius map and all of its iterates are going to be finite morphisms. So F to the E are finite maps. So, and um, as an example, or class of examples, if you'd like, take, uh, take your favorite field of characteristic P. Characteristic P, just, but make sure that when you take, say, P to the eth roots of the field, this is a finite dimensional vector space over the base field. Okay, and then you can just take R to be, say, any extension, polynomial ring, quotient, uh, you can localize, and you can even do like a iatic completion. These types of constructions will always produce FI rings. Okay. All right, the other bit of notation. So we have this ring homomorphism, or ring homomorphisms for the, the Frobenius iterates of, in, uh, of the Frobenius endomorphism. And you have a map between two rings, right? So, right, so we have phi from an arbitrary ring map, R to S. You can turn R modules into S modules by extending scalars. Or you can turn S modules into R modules by restricting scalars. And there's some other things we can do to play around with the modules of R and S and make them into modules over the other ring. But the one we will focus on today is restricting scalars. Right? So we can restrict scalars. Scalars. Uh, so if M is a S module, we have this lower star, phi lower star of M, the, uh, it's just going to be the restriction of scalars. So this is in R mod, or mod R, and it's 
as a set, of course, it's just equal to itself. And then, but if you want to multiply by an element, of course, that just means apply phi to the element from R. And so we can do the same thing here. So if, you know, let's just apply this idea of restricting scalars to the Frobenius, and we get the so called Frobenius push forwards by module. So, so we have an R module. So F E lower star M is just the R mod obtained via restriction of scalars. Okay, under F E. Right, so we start off with an R module here, and then we turn it into an R module here. And the, the source and, and the, the notation we'll use, so if M is an element of M, just take F E lower star little M to be the same element of the induced model obtained by restricting scalars, then of course, though, if we want to multiply by an element from R, you can do that by just applying Frobenius to R, or the iterate of Frobenius. Okay. Um, so, and then the other kind of running assumption here, so unless M is some sort of local cohomology model, uh, we assume M is finitely generated. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's do an example of this restriction of scalars. Examples. So, so the first example, it's kind of the standard one. Um, and the second one is just gonna be more or less the same version of this, but let's take R to be, let's take a field, the D field with say P elements, let's join the variables and just localize at the close point, X1 through XD. All right, so this is a regular local ring and what it's a fun kind of like standard exercise to do, but F E lower star R here, this is one of the few times you can very explicitly compute the module structure of these restrictions of scalars, even under R. Um, but what ends up happening here is it's not too bad to show that this thing is a free module of rank P to the D with basis uh, given by, so if you take the R span of the monomials, F E lower star X1 to I1, XD, ID, but just make sure each of these exponents doesn't exceed P to the E. Um, and then the other example, but this is really the same, very similar to one. So if R is now a regular local ring, so a regular local ring, all right? So this will imply R is CM. This will imply F E lower star is a maximal on the Macaulay module. Okay. All right, so, and then we're in the setting of a regular ring, so everything has finite projective dimension. We have a nice formula floating around um, that will tell us what the projective dimension is. And it will actually tell us that since its depth is maximal, it's to the dimension of R, we actually get that this projective dimension is zero, which still implies which is the same thing as saying F E lowers R R is free. It's really the same thing as one. Um, but the point is, if you have a regular local ring, you restrict scalars under Frobenius, you get free modules. And quite amazingly, like the, in some aspect, I mean, arguably the kind of the starting point of, of prime characteristic community of algebra is this realization that the, the, this property that F e lowers to R becomes free is actually characterizing non-singularity. So the following R equivalent. So in the setting of a local F finite ring, uh, R is a regular local ring to F e lowers to R is free uh, for every natural number. And then three, you actually only need this to work for one natural number. All 
All right. Okay. And so, heuristically, um, what we can say now is, so what we should do is uh, regular, in the context of a local F on a ring, it's just the same thing as saying at the lowest R is free. Okay. And so this will motivate the, the defining singularity class that we're going to be focused in on today. So, so for today, we're going to look at the notion of strongly F regular. So we're back to the situation of a local F finite ring uh, is called strongly F regular. Um, but I will just be using the words F regular since we don't have to worry about distinguishing between different F regularity classes in this talk. Um, if, so I'm given a slightly non-standard definition, but that's be fine. So, so uh, if for every non-zero element of the ring, there exists an E large enough or equivalently for all E sufficiently large, uh, there exists E large enough and there exists an R linear map from F E lower star R back to R such that you get a commutative diagram. So R, okay, so we have a Frobenius map to, to R. And then if you apply the restriction of scalars to this target, this is now a legitimate R module homomorphism. We'll go to F e lower star R. This will be multiplication by the element C, but inside F e lower star R. And then here's our map phi. And what are we requiring of this map? Well, you can take the identity map here on R and get a commutative diagram. And so really what, what we're saying here is what you should, what this is saying is, is for each non-zero element, uh, that this element F e lower star C, as it sits inside F e lower star big R, contributes to a free sum end. So, so let me just kind of phrase it like that. So if R is F regular, so the whole point of this definition, really what we're saying here, then every non-zero element uh, gives a free sum end. And this is, you know, quotations here, gives a free sum end of F e lower star R, or E big enough. All right, and so the what we should think about is strongly F regular means, so, or F regular, F regular is equal to, all right, so maybe F e star is not necessarily free, uh, but it's has lots of free sum ends. And this is just a heuristic. Right, so regular means we have as many free sum ends as possible. F regular just means we're going to have lots and lots in some well-defined sense. All right, so page. So let's maybe talk about some basic properties of F regular rings. So I'll call this proposition A. So let R still in this. F finite local ring setting, um, be F regular. Okay, then few few basic properties. One, R is a domain. Uh, better yet, it's normal, so it's integrally closed in its field of fractions. And then three, it's also called Macaulay. R is called Macaulay. Right, so it has, I've already used this term, but just as a reminder, so the depth of R is equal to the dimension of R, and we can detect this with local cohomology. So this is if and only if H I M of R vanishes for all I less than D, which is the dimension. Okay. So, so every F regular local ring is a normal Cohen-Macaulay domain. So, 
It's nice. Um, so let me sketch the proof of three. Give you an idea of why they have to be called Macaulay. Give some indication of what's going on there. And then uh, after I finish that, I would just want to list maybe a few examples of F regular rings or classes of rings that are all F regular. So proof of three. Um, so the idea is this. So do kind of, you know, so we're going to assume one and two. We're going to assume we already know it's at least a normal domain. Um, uh, and let's assume we've gone through kind of the standard like commutative algebra hoops of getting to the complete case. Okay. So in this scenario, what you can always do is you can always find a, an annihilator of all the, the local cohomology modules. So, so there exists a non-zero element of R such that we can annihilate every single one of these modules below the dimension. All right. Okay, um, and now we use the fact that we're F regular. So, so right, so we're F regular. Uh, so there exists E big enough, phi from an R linear map from this restriction of scalars back to R um, with that produces a commutative diagram. So R to F E lowest R R. So this is our Frobenius. Then we're going to multiply by C. And then we have our phi going back to R. And this is the identity. OK. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to apply H I M, so local cohomology with I less than D. So we got H I M, H I M, H I M. H -I -M. <laughs> now, there's a what ends up happening here is as as groups, this H I M of F E lower star R is actually H I M of R. Now this identify, identification is only as a group, not as a module. So I gotta be a little bit careful here, but that's okay. And same thing here. And with this identification, this multiplication by F e lower star little c, it's just the same thing as multiplication by c. And c was chosen to annihilate all the lower local cohomology modules. So this is actually the zero map on these local cohomology. And so what we've shown here is that the identity map on all these local cohomology modules factors through the zero map. So ID, identity on the local cohomology factors through zero, which implies, of course, this is zero. Okay. Yeah, I just want to give kind of like a flavor of some of these arguments with that regular rings. So uh, kind of standard theory. Okay. Okay. So I want to do, a, oh yeah, I said I wanted to list some examples because it's nice to know examples. So the examples we uh, need to look at. Examples of F regular rings. Um, so I'll just list some classes of examples because they do show up quite a bit. So, right, so if you think about this heuristic that R is regular if and only if F e lower star R is free and R is, is F regular if and only if F e lower star R has lots of sum ends, free sum ends, that heuristic is telling us regular rings are all F regular. B. Um, you know, whatever classes of rings that we give that are F regular, they better all be uh, normal Cole Macaulay domains. So, but some examples that do this, so we could do normal torque rings, normal affine torque rings. So make sure you, know, you form a, you know, an affine torque variety of a full dimensional cone, the corresponding 
torque ring will always be F regular. Um, but this is coming from the fact that these are direct summands of regular rings. So direct summands of regular rings are always F regular. Uh, let's see. And then, oh, another good set of examples. So we could do rational double points in dimension two. Points in dimension two. So for those familiar with surface singularities, this is a great set of examples as long as you're working with uh, at least characteristic seven. Um, if you're dealing with two, three, five, it's the classification. So these singularities are quite a bit more complex and you have to kind of go through a case by case scenario. All right. Okay, um, so I do have another kind of like basic proposition I wanna go through about F regular rings. And the point of the, this next basic proposition is gonna really motivate the significance of the, the main theorem I wanna present. So, so proposition B, it's kind of another a basic kind of standard fact about F regular rings. It's a nice little exercise, but we'll go through the proof. So let R be F regular. And let's pick out a torsion-free module. Module. Now, in particular, since R is a domain um, and it's Colin Macaulay, it uh, you know it makes sense to talk about Colin Macaulay modules over this thing. And if you're working over a domain, every maximal Colin Macaulay module is torsion-free. So, for example, M is Maximal cone Macaulay. Okay. Um, then, um, then there exists an E in the natural numbers such that F E lower star M has a free summand. So when I use this notation, this just means just I'll write this out explicitly one time. This just means F E lowers R can be decomposed with a free sum and plus something else. And I'll just use a, a dash to represent something else. You have to do that several times. Okay. Um, and so let's let's just look at the proof. So and the proof is going to show something more. We can actually split off any non-zero element. So just pick a non-zero element. M. Now, since M is a, doing this assumption that M is finally generated, it's torsion free, R is a domain. And so one of the kind of basic things you can do here is uh, there exists a map from M to R that's R linear such that we can map this non-zero element to a non-zero element of R. Okay, now R is F regular. Right, so there we can split off. So there exists E, there exists phi, F equals R to R. So we get this commutative diagram. So, right, so we can go uh, R to F lower star R, F lower star C, F lower star R, R, D, identity. Right, so, uh, or yeah. And so, so the idea, what am I doing? This is not what I want to do. Excuse me. We have M mapping to R. Okay, yeah, this is what I want to do. Yeah. So we have the E large enough, we have the phi large enough. So you take this map where eta goes to C, which is non-zero, and then apply the Frobenius restriction of scalars. F e lower star eta, F e lower star C, and then we apply the phi that sends that C to one. And so here, F e lower star C gets maps to one. And so, yes, you follow this diagram and the, the non-zero element that we picked out gets mapped to one. And so we pick up a free summit and that element eta gives an 
free sun and a few lower star. Okay. Now the uh, the main theorem. All right. So the the main theorem is this, and it's uh, it's very much in that spirit of that proposition where any torsion-free module picks up a free sum n after you restrict scalars enough, but it's a uniform version of that statement. So, so let R local f finite be f regular, regular. There exists a natural number E naught uh, such that if M is finitely generated maximal column Macaulay, column Macaulay, uh, then F E not lower star M has a free sum N. Now the, uh, the significance here is What's being read off in the statement is that this E naught is completely independent of the Colin Macaulay module M. Right? So, you know, up to isomorphism, R is very likely not to have finite, or is very likely to have infinitely many isomorphism classes of Colin Macaulay modules and or irreducible Colin Macaulay modules. And but this is giving a uniform behavior of all those modules, which is take any Colin Macaulay module M, restrict scalars after just finitely many times in a way that doesn't depend on M, and you always pick up a free sum M. Um, now, I'm not going to do the proof of this, um, but I do want to emphasize that the proof of this is only requires like a working knowledge of the, the material and say like the, the first section of Bruns and Herzog. Um, it's just a lot of duality, and also there's a, in the background there's a Chevrolet's lemma in the background. But I do want to emphasize that this proof is very like proving this theorem is very appropriate for like a, a, a topics course in commutative algebra or like a second course even in commutative algebra. It's not it's not terribly difficult, but it is. I, I, I do feel like the arguments behind this are very clever. This was not something I was expecting and just kind of having to find type thing. But but there are some interesting applications on it on too. And there's at least applications concerning the divisor class group of an F regular ring. And there's applications concerning the F signature of a local ring. Um, I'm gonna pass on the F signature stuff today and instead focus in on divisor class groups. So so that was kind of part one of the talk, kind of introduce F regular rings, get to this main theorem concerning, like it's a representation theoretic statement concerning column Macaulay modules over F regular rings. And now I want to talk about applications to divisor class groups. Okay. And then uh, after we get through the applications, I have a couple, at least a couple open problems to pose. Um, so, so throughout, right, I still want to just fix a local ring, local F finite, and we're going to assume F regular. So this is just the assumption for the remainder. Um, and of course, just as a reminder, this implies R is a normal domain. Call Macaulay even, but in particular, because it's a normal day, domain, we actually have a class group to talk about. And so let's briefly remind ourselves what this is. So class group and CL. So, so as a reminder, so we have this notion of a V divisor. So a V divisor, or I'll just put W div of R. So this is a this is a free abelian group. Abelian group generated on the height one primes of R. Right. 
Right, so, so an element of this thing just looks like this. So D equals N1, P1 plus NL, PL, where the NIs are integers, positive or negative, and the PIs are height one primes. All right, now what you can do with these divisors, um, you can use this divisors to keep track of, of divisorial ideals or rank one S2 models, but let me describe that. So, you know, D's divisor, I said D of A divisor. So <clears throat> with this thing, we have uh, an associated uh, fractional ideal. So the fractional ideal I'll denote by R of D, and this is contained inside the fraction field of R. Um, and examples of how these divisorial ideals work. So if, you know, so let's just say D was equal to P, right, as a height one prime. So if that's a height one prime, then uh, R of minus D will be, will recover just the height one prime P. Um, R of D would be P to the negative one, which what you can take this to mean is this can be the elements of the fraction field, which multiply P, or when you multiply this element by the fraction field, or this element from the fraction field multiplies the entire prime ideal back, keeps it in R. Um, something like R of minus 3D would be P symbolic 3, where that is like a legitimate symbolic power, the P cubed R plus P intersect R. <laughs> Um, and then I guess more generally, if you want to do something like R of minus 2P1 plus 3P2, right, so this divisorial ideal would end up being, you take the second symbolic power of this first height 1 prime, and then you intersect it with this negative symbolic power of P2, and, and you know, to understand this negative symbolic power, you can follow this type of idea. Okay. Let's see. Ah. Okay. So I need to discuss. I want to give a little basic proposition. Uh, oh, I'm not done talking about the classroom. And say yes. So not. Okay. So those are the just examples of how the visual ideals work. That's right. That's where we're at. And so, so uh, the class group of R then is defined to be uh, well. You take this free abelian group, this really large free abelian group, a very large rank of the divisors. And we're going to quotient out by a um, uh, equivalence relation on this thing where. Two divisors are linearly equivalent. Uh, it's the same thing as saying that these corresponding fractional ideals are isomorphic. Um, but this should be the same thing as if you took the element D1 minus D2 being the same thing as zero, which is then the same thing as R of D1 minus D2 being isomorphic to R. Right, but anyways, the, the, the point is if you have this, this divisor class group is the Bay divisor mod the equivalence relation, and the equivalence relation is given by D1 is the same as D2, provided the corresponding fraction the same, or same up isomorphism. And then a couple important things, or at least one really big important thing is, as a reminder, R is a unique factorization domain, is completely the same as saying the class group quotients out to zero. Uh, and so, anyways, this uh, this divisor class group of a local ring, or you don't even need local there. The normal domain is just it's giving you information about the behavior of irreducible elements in your ring and the way products of elements. Come on, Mom. 
There's someone in the background that has their mic on. If you don't mind turning it off. Okay. Anjan, Anjan, can you switch off your mic, please? Thank you. All right. So I believe we're at. Oh, stick to my notes. All right. So this is called Lima D in my notes. Let's keep it with Lima D. So I won't prove this, but this is kind of a like a basic, um, nice arithmetic type of rule one has with these divisors and the behavior with restricting scalars and nephrobenius. So, um, so if we take a couple of the divisors, okay, and we're gonna let blank star denote homing back into R. Then we have a really nice kind of like arithmetic or like algebraic, no, let me just write it out. So F E lower star R of D1, right? So take the fractional ideal R of D1, restrict under scalars, under the Frobenius. Now let's say we wanted to base change this thing, or not base change it, we want to tensor with R of D2. It's not a base change. Uh, the point is, is you can take this reflexive hull, right? We can hum it twice and produce a reflexive module, and that reflexive module will actually end up naturally isomorphic to this, right? Um, so the, right, so the game is, like the, the arithmetic rule here is, is you can bring this D2 inside of this parentheses here when you're playing around with these divisorial ideals, but the price is you have to scale by the Frobenius. So you end up multiplying by P to the E on D2 when you pull it in. So. So I'll just leave, I just wanted to state that little, that little lemma and, and now we can see some pretty cool stuff. So we'll start with a little proposition that has been well known, proven by several different sources. And then we'll get to a really, I think, pretty couple neat applications to the divisor class group. So, um, so proposition E. So if R is F regular, and so in particular, Cohen Macaulay. So remember, F regular rings are Cohen Macaulay. And so it really makes a lot of sense to talk about its Cohen Macaulay modules. There's going to be a lot of them. So if R is F regular <clears throat> and D and the class group of R is torsion. So it's a torsion element, meaning, i.e., you know, there exists an N so that N D is linearly equivalent to zero, where you know N is say greater than equal to one. Then, um, I, so, which is the same thing as saying, you know, this, this particular fractional ideal is a principle. All right, so let's keep that in mind. All right, um, so if R is F regular and D in class is torsion, um, then this fractional ideal is actually a finally generated maximal Cohen Macaulay module. Okay, so proof, um, so I should say, you know, this has been known for a while. So there's a article of, uh, let's see, Padalakthi, not getting that person's name, saying that person's name correctly, and uh, Carl Schweed uh, proved this. There was a, another proof given by uh, Heilong Dao and Tony Say, um, but the proof I'm gonna follow is given by, uh, follows, from, it's found in a paper of Isaac Martin, uh, I was an undergrad student, um, or was an undergrad student of mine. Um, so, so up to isomorphism, the list of modules so R of D, R of 2D, so forth. We can even throw in, you know, the negatives. We can even throw in the zero if we'd like. It's fine. So up to isomorphism, this list of modules is finite. All right, this this is what the torsion element is going to buy you. As you keep, you know, twisting the divisor and looking at the corresponding fractional ideals, you're just going to start repeating the same list of uh, of uh, modules up to isomorphisms because as an element of class R, since that element's torsion, as you twist the divisor, you just hit the same, start hitting the same elements over and over again in the class group. 
And so there was a proposition. So by, I think it's proposition uh, B, this like kind of elementary proposition where every torsion free module has a free sum and these things are all torsion free. They're all contained inside the fraction field. So by proposition B, there exists uh, E such that F E lower star R of N D has a free sum and uh, for all E or not for all E, excuse me, for, for all N. Okay. All right. Just applying that proposition and just taking E large enough to guarantee that all of these modules, this finite list of modules of the isomorphism, all have a free sum. You can do this. And in particular, if we apply this in a very specific way, in particular, F E lower star R of minus P to the E D has a free sum and. Right, so the, the, the tricky thing here, or the neat thing here, is that this E and this E are the same. Now, what are we going to do? Well, you apply um, tensor with R of D, and then take the reflexive hull and, and apply the previous lemma. Apply lemma D. Okay, so what is that going to tell you? So F E lower star R of minus P to the E D tensor R of D reflexification is isomorphic to what's going to end up happening on the left or the right hand side is you're going to have R of D direct sum something, you know, whatever the previous something was, you tensor with R of D reflexify, whatever you get. It's going to be, it's going to be a mess, but you get something. But you definitely have this R of D is a free sum, or not, not a free sum, but it is a direct sum of this reflexification. Now, this by lemma D, we can do this, and the game that gets played is you can pull the D inside of the other parentheses, that's where the restriction of scalars is going is occurring, but you end up adding. Oops, it's a minus. All right, so lemma D says the left-hand side is actually isomorphic to F E star R. All right, so what we're saying here is that R D is a free is a sum and of F E lower star R. R is called Macaulay. This one implies this this thing is called Macaulay is maximal call Macaulay, which implies R D is. Maximal column Macaulay, because direct sum ends of maximal column Macaulay modules are still maximal, have to be maximal column Macaulay. That's, that's the proof there. All right. All right. So, so, okay. So we have this theorem about F regular rings. So let me scroll up. Um, right. So the main theorem just says, all right. So if you start off with an F regular ring, there exists this uniform E naught so that if M is any maximal column Macaulay module, then F E naught lower star M picks up a free sum M. And the E naught had no dependence on M, just required that it was column Macaulay. And we just, we just saw in this little proposition, there's a pretty interesting set of, uh, set of column Macaulay modules inside every F regular ring, which is, any uh, divisorial ideal associated to a torsion divisor is always called Macaulay. So let's apply that theorem to torsion divisors, and you end up with a pretty neat corollary. So the corollary of the main theorem and the fact that uh, divisorial ideals of torsion divisors um, are, yeah, we're on F, so corollary F. So the corollary is this, so uh, let R and K be F regular, be F regular. Um, let's do T of C L R. It's just the divisors in the class group of R. So this is the torsion subgroup. All right, so this is the torsion subgroup, the divisor class group. Um, then this thing has finite cardinality. It's only finite in many torsion divisors. All 
Okay. Well, let's do the proof. And it's going to be very similar uh, to the proof of proposition E that we just saw, except there's going to be a little bit of a tweak involving the main theorem. So, so by pro oh, uh, I need to throw in an assumption. I don't need to throw this assumption in, but we're going to throw it in. Uh, assume R is complete. This is not necessary, but this will shorten up the proof considerably. So assume R is complete. <clears throat> so, uh, so by the previous proposition, so that's proposition E. Uh, if D is torsion, then R of D is maximum Paul Macaulay by theorem. I uh, believe the main theorem, I believe I called it C, so this is just the main theorem of the day. Um, there exists an E naught such that for all torsion divisors, T C L of R, uh, F E naught lower star R of D has a free sum in. In particular, Right, so now we're just going to repeat the trick from the previous proposition. Uh, for every torsion divisor, um, we can look at F E naught lower star R of minus D. Naught D. And this thing has to be has to have a free sum in. And of course, the critical thing here is, is that this E naught and this E naught are the same integer. And so what we do, well, we we Tensor with R D, reflexify, take the reflexive hole. So apply R D tensor, reflexify, and get. So as before, what you'll end up getting is that F E naught lower star R is isomorphic to R D. Right? So it looks very much the same. But now the key point is, is that the, the E naught didn't depend on D. So I'll put that in red. E naught does not depend on D, right? That's, that's the critical step. Uh, D, wow. D. All right, and so what we do now is, here's where the, the complete assumption comes in uh, to really kind of streamline what's about to happen here. So if D1 through DT are uh, elements of the torsion class group, uh, but are distinct, right? So this just means R of DI is not isomorphic to R of DJ. <clears throat> then, so this is all being distinct means, then by Kroll-Schmidt, right? So the Kroll-Schmidt says over a complete ring, complete local ring, a finally generated module decomposes uniquely into irreducible modules. Uh, all these fractional ideals are going to be irreducible. And so by the Carl Schmidt condition, what we're going to end up getting is that F E naught lower star R has all of these modules as summands simultaneously. Okay. And now the whole thing is, is that F E naught lower star R is a uh, finitely generated module. And so by rank considerations, there can only be finitely many elements in the torsion class groups. Considerations. Okay. Let's prove that. All right. Um, so the other corollary I want to give about divisor class groups. Let's see, corollary. Yeah. So corollary G. All right. So corollary G isn't or isn't new. This was known, and I want to give both proofs that I know. Um, so corollary G. Um, so so this one's very specific to uh, two-dimensional rings. So 
let R be two dimensional enough regular. And F regular. Then the uh, then it's not just the torsion class group is going to be finite, but uh, the, the entire divisor class group is finite. And in particular, since you know class group of R is a, an abelian group, you know if a group is finite, it's everything is torsion. All right, and this was this was well known way before this talk. Um, <clears throat> but let me give two proofs. I'll give the proof one. So this is how it would have been done historically. So uh, f regular. So r is f regular, which implies r is something called uh, f rational. This is you know, if you go into the definition of f rational, this is almost by definition. I mean, there's there's not much to be checked there. Now, something interesting happens. Uh, so due to Karen Smith, so this means R has what is called pseudo-rational singularities. Now, this is a very important paper coming out of Karen Smith's you know, collection of works. This is one of the big ones um, to do this. You know, so rational rings have rational singularities, name of the paper. Okay. Um, now, <clears throat> now we're going to quote some stuff of Kuhn's, going back to the 60s. Um, R actually has what is called rational singularities. Um, this is because, all right, so there's a couple of results here. So this is actually Kuhn's input here. So, um, <clears throat> so the Kuhn's will tell you that every F finite ring is what is called excellent, great. And then Lippmann will tell us that every two-dimensional uh, excellent local ring emits a resolution of singularities. And in particular, since R has pseudo rational singularities and it has a resolution of singularities, we now are in the realm of what we call rational singularities. Um, great. Now, another monumental piece of literature due to Lippmann, uh, you know, his, his infamous rational singularities paper, but this will actually imply that the class group of R is finite. And this is really relying on understanding that a uh, rational singularity in dimension two um, that's excellent can be resolved by just blowing up points, just doing point like uh, iterates of blowing up points. And then there's also this knowledge that you know, when you look at the resolution of a two dimensional local singularity, you can look at the so-called intersection matrix from the exceptional divisors coming from the re resolution or the minimal resolution. And this matrix will always form something that is uh, negative definite. And from that, you're able to derive that the class group of R is finite. Um, so it, but even, the, I guess the, the point I wanna make here is this result in dimension two is, you know, the way it's been known for quite some time is quite impressive, the amount of knowledge that had to go into to proving this result. So quite a bit, there's at least, you know, I would argue four just really remarkable papers just going behind this proof. Proof two. All right, so R is two dimensional. Okay, so let's just keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> and F regular. Uh, so D, if D is, uh, so if D is any V divisor, so R D is always S2. This holds in any dimension. This, it's, you know, it's depth at any localization is at least two or the height of the prime. If you localize to something height one or lower, it's always S2. And since we're in this low dimensional case, we're in a column of RD is now maximal column column, right? We don't need this condition that D was, we didn't have to assume D was torsion to force this to happen. It just happens for free. And so now, so repeat the, the proof of corollary F, corollary F, to show um, that if E naught is as in the main theorem, as in the main theorem, then uh, then uh, then uh, if 
D1 through DT are distinct. Then we can realize every single one of these ideals, fractional ideals, is a summand of F E naught plus star R. And then as before, this will imply the class group of R is now finite by rank considerations. All right. Okay. Perfect. All right. So I got a couple open problems I want to put on the board. Um, and that's going to be, I think, a great place to stop for, for this week. So, open problems, conjectures. I'll call them conjectures. So, there's one that's been floating around for a while. Um, uh, and the, the stuff I just presented kind of proves half of this first conjecture. So if R is local F regular, um, the, there's an expectation that the class group is a uh, finitely generated abelian group. Generated group. Right. Right. So we expect. Right. Uh, so really, you know, by the the fundamental theorem of uh, finitely generated bidding groups. So we expect, you know, the the class group of R to be isomorphic to the torsion-free part. So a free module of finite rank direct sum the torsion part. So th this is what we expect. Right. And now what we know. So we know. Um, the torsion part of the class group of R is finite, um, which then implies uh, by general group theory stuff. So just I'll, I'll just call it group theory. That the class group of R is isomorphic to the class group of R mod the torsion direct sum the, the class group or not uh, the torsion subgroup. All right, so so the, the the game to be played that still needs to be done is we still need to show that this is so we need to show um, something like uh, show that this is isomorph this is finite generated. Right. Um, so you have to try to rule out things like you know how how does one you know right, so for example what am I trying to say here so how how do we show you know, something like Q is not contained in the class group, you know, provided R is F regular. And I, there are ways to do things like this. You, you know, I can, you know, um, but, right, but I, I guess I'm trying to illustrate these are the types of problems you'd have to, or type of questions one would have to start asking yourself, all right, if you wanted to attack this, this conjecture. Um, uh, two. Uh, is a uh, is a global version of the uh, corollary. So right. So, or actually, I'll just do a more. Uh, so, uh, so if R is uh, you know F regular but not local, not local. Right. So you can try to ask for like a global analog of this and. I'm running short on time, so I'm not going to motivate exactly how I'm going to phrase this. But if you want it like a global version of this statement that the torsion class group is finite, the correct way to ask this for experts that are more familiar with the visor class groups um, is uh, is uh, the so-called set of tor uh, Q Cartier divisors. Q Cartier Bay divisors modulo the Cartier divisors, finite. Um, and I just, I'll, I'll remark, uh, the last thing I'll remark on is if R is local, Q Cartier divisors is the same thing as the torsion class group. 
and Cartier divisors of a local ring are always zero. And the notion of a Cartier divisor is, means trivially it's lo uh, locally it's trivial. So, and so this is like a, the the legit, this would be the right uh, global version of the statement that a local a regular ring has finite torsion class group. Okay, so that's that's where I'll end, and I'll I'll stop here. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, we will take some questions from audience. Uh, may I ask a qu question? Yes. Please. Uh, Watanabe. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so in your theory, uh, the number E naught is very important. Yes. And uh, for if you give some concrete example, can mm. you have some? Do you have some method to fix E naught? So let me show you where it comes from. Uh, I know you'll appreci appreciate where this comes from and why I can't. So let me let me pull up my stuff again. Let me show you where the E not comes from very briefly. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. So the way it comes up is as follows. Um, so take a look at the canonical module mm -hmm. and take any system of parameters. X bar is uh, any SOP. R. Hmm. All right, back to this local case. Now, what we do is we do these like splitting submodules of Omega. Mm -hmm. Okay. Eta, eh, such that. F E looks like Eta does not split. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, what ends up happening is these things are, this is descending. Uh, descending um, uh, in primary, they, they intersect to zero is the important part. This is where F comes in. And so Chevrolet's lemma, mm -hmm. lemma uh, implies there exists an E naught, and this is the E naught in the theorem. Uh -huh. Such that I E naught omega R has to be contained inside X bar times omega bar. Okay. And now the key point is um, if M, and this is actually a fun exercise, uh, and this proves the theorem. This is actually worth trying to do on your own. Uh, so use if M is MCM, uh, if you take any element of M that's not an X bar, then there exists a map from M to omega such that uh, phi of eta is not in X bar omega. That's kind of the key point. So if you take any maximal Cole Macaulay module, something that's not too deep in the module relative to like a parameter ideal, then you can always map it into them. And then you use, use this. And that, that's, that's, that's why I argue this is not a uh -huh. particularly deep proof, but it, it, the argument is clever. Mm -hmm. I, I really like the argument. Okay, thank you very much. Of course. Uh, thank you very much for your very nice lecture. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. Mm. Right. Actually, I will, can I say one more thing for like 30 seconds? Um, I did, uh, this will be my F signature. Thing. For those who do know what F signature is, I will remark that that theorem gives an elementary proof uh, that if R is F regular, then this so-called is an invariant called the F signature, and it's always at least the Hilbert Coons over P to the E naught D, where the E naught is once again that same uh -huh. E naught in the theorem. Uh -huh. And that's the, the, the application of F signature. It recovers this uh -huh. theorem of Aberbach and Lushky in a very easy way. Uh, yeah, it removes a lot of it in the result. So 
Thomas, I, I have a question. You wrote result about two dimensional F regular rings. Yes. Uh, a class group. Uh, but now in arbitrary dimension, you are not saying it is finite, but it is finitely generated. Do I that's ask? that's the conjecture. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, this is a problem. I know that at least dates back to Carl Schwede's days at Michigan, because uh, I I was originally asked that question by Carl, who was originally asked that question by Mel Hoxter during those days. So it's, it's a question that's been floating around for a while. And the uh, the analog of F regular rings in, in the birational geometry world is these uh, so-called KLT singularities. And the, the, the corresponding result there does apparently work. The divisor class group is finally generated. And all the examples we can ever produce always have finally generated class groups. But in the case of dimension three uh, F regular rings, we know so there are so many examples. Mm -hmm. uh, have people calculated the class group of uh, these rings? Like the, uh, no, I, I mean, actually, why would not be in the audience? Might I mean, be better to answer that rings, I mean, Class groups of toric rings are calculated in characteristic p. Well, so the class group of a toric ring isn't so bad to do. So there. There, it, it doesn't depend on the characteristic. It's it's just a game with the, the matrix, uh, the matrix with the rays. It's, um, yeah. Yeah, it's not too bad. It's a co-kernel of a particular matrix corresponding yeah. to the, yeah. 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 yeah, toric rings are a little deceiving, characteristic P, because somehow P doesn't seem to really mess anything up. So mm. it can be a little too, too nice sometimes. Yeah, no. and, and for do we know the result for uh, rings of invariants? Because they are uh, also uh, regular with some conditions. Uh, I mean, their divisor class groups must have been calculated. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's see, let's see how well my brain can work here. So, yes, if you go uh, the the determinantal rings book uh, text, there's some material in there that. I, want to say i want to say for those rings you're in that you're, you're going to end up with just a free free group finally generated free group oh, I see. Um, and you so you're saying conjecture is known for rings of invariance yes yes yeah, yeah the conjecture is known for the yeah the example classes for sure i see um, but like the, the, you know, I think the more interesting way to talk about this is how do you produce a ring that doesn't have finite generated class group? And you know, one of the ways I like to do this is take like an elliptic curve or something or cone point over a curve, and that's a two-dimensional graded thing, but you can localize if you're relevant maximal ideal, and that class group is humongous. But when you do these things, you never produce an F regular ring. And that's kind of the interesting observations is these, you know, if, if, if you did this process and you produce an F-regular ring, it's coming from a variety that is so-called globally F-regular, and those things have amazingly nice properties. So, Right. right. So there was this example uh, uh, which, which Ries constructed to give a counterexample of Jariski's conjecture uh, mm -hmm. by taking a point on elliptic curve which has infinite order. Yes, I mean that you produce right. That's that the way not, yeah. to produce. This is the uh, standard way to produce a infinitely generated divisor class. Yes. Uh -huh. that, yeah, that will never give an effort. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what's so fascinating about it. I think that's the fascinating way to consider the conjecture. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, uh, but yeah, what I, so something that is not written down. Um, you know, the, the way I initially attacked that problem was I tried to rule out what groups, like if something wasn't finally generated, like what are some examples of non-finally generated groups? So things like the rational numbers or Z adjoined one over N is the really a good example to try to mess with. And what you can rule out pretty easily is something like Z adjoined one over P cannot be a, a subgroup, a divisor class group. So, I, I, yeah. But yeah, there's, I mean, there's all sorts of fun games to play with it, but, mm -hmm. but I think some more serious stuff is going to be needed to really, to tackle it. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, any questions? Further questions? Uh, uh, may I ask a question? Sure. Mm -hmm. yes, uh, first of all, thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, <laughs> I'm wondering uh, if uh, uh, F regular rings are gonistin or not. If uh, they are oh. gonistin, my question will not be okay. But if they are not, uh, uh, is it possible to extend your main theorem from maximal Cohen Macaulay uh, modules to totally reflexive modules? That's a good question. I haven't thought about that. So, yeah, that's something worth thinking about. Um, but yeah, my, no, no F regular rings uh, don't have to be Gornstein. Um, oh, in good. fact, yeah, yeah. In fact, when it comes to like conjectures and open problems with F regular rings, for the most part, it's outside of the Gornstein case is where the work needs to be done. You know, when things are Gornstein, it's, we seem to know everything we want to know about F regular rings for the most part. Uh, we don't have an answer on the device classroom question by any means, or even like a hypersurface, but, um, but yeah, no, uh, they don't I mean, have to be Gornstein. I mean, there are many rings of invariants which are not Gorenstein, but they are uh -huh. regular. There we go, perfect, yeah. Right. Perfect. So it's reasonable to think about uh, totally reflexive modules. Oh, 100%. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good idea to think of this. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And uh, could you uh, tell us uh, the, your papers that these results are appearing? Mm. Yes. So, uh, oh, no, 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 it's not too good. Uh, oh, let me try to pull it. So, yeah, the, 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 the papers are the, the main. Oh, come on. Let's go up to the top. So, the research article that you'll find these theorems and applications in is this first one. It's called a mm -hmm. theorem about maximal column Kali modules, um, but also as a bit of an advertisement. Is uh, the second source uh, F singularities a commutative algebra approach is with uh, Lin Chuan Ma. Now it's still in a preliminary version, but that is available on both of our websites. Um, I think it's like maybe seventy pages right now. We'll update it soon. It'll be like closer to hundred pages after the. The update, and I'm sure we'll get a little bit longer by the end of the summer. But, but yeah, no, we treat a lot of this S singularity theory using these kind of elementary Bruns and Herzog level approaches for the overall majority of the part, including the stuff I did today. This is all in that those notes. Uh, Thank you. you. Put a link to these two resources in our uh, seminar webpage, Thomas. Yeah, that'd be perfect. Yeah. Yeah, I can send, uh, do you want me to send you links? Yeah, I, I have seen your expository paper with Lin Chuan Ma uh, mm -hmm. in your office. Yeah, it's a, okay. it's a nice nice exposition. Thanks. Yeah, the, uh, the other paper, it's available in the archive and it should appear in a journal soon. soon. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. I mean, tight, tight closure is hidden, but you don't refer to it at all. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, tight closure talks these days get pretty hard. You know, yeah. I mean, well, the tight closure talks I have. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, I just, I did one at the MSRS. So. I mean, yeah. the way I learned that regular ring is through tight closure. But uh, yeah. it is, uh, in case of a finite situation, you have more uh, arrow theoretic definition. So mm. one can quickly see why it is Gwen Macaulay. You don't have to appeal to colon capturing and all that. So things are yeah. Become, quite, yeah. I think I have an interesting feeling towards tight closure theory and this theory of F regular rings. Like, so I, you know, I'm coming into this theory, this school of thought a little bit later than when it was first developed. And I really feel like the, a lot of the initial developments, uh, when you look at tight closure, that definition, it, it's integral closure, right? It's this Reese criterion for detecting integral closure type argument and and it I, I it's an amazing theory there's no doubt about it it's incredible um but when it comes to the theory of f regular rings you know maybe that isn't sometimes the most natural approach maybe it's more of this behavior for Benius and f star r um and then it has amazing applications 
into the theory of tight closure where you try to make these real um, beautiful, wonderful connections with like multiplicity theory and more classical commutative algebra. Mm -hmm. That's a personal feeling of mine. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah, that's how I approach the theory. It's not necessarily through multiplicity theory anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I guess uh, we want to close for today. We shall meet next Friday when you will bring in F furniture. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Perfect. Okay. All so, right. Thank you very much, Thomas. And uh, we will close yeah. the meeting. Thanks, all participants.